My name is Christopher Dickey. I'm with Newsweek and the Daily Beast and a member of the Council, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting with President Monsef Marzouki of Tunisia. Uh, and I have this little script that I have to read that they give you. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, probably know it by heart. I'd also like to welcome the CFR members around the nation and the world who are participating in this meeting through the live stream and via video conference from Washington, D.C. We will hear from them during the question and answer session. And uh, Chris Tuttle, who's the director of the Council on Foreign Relations Washington meetings, is moderating uh, from Washington. Our next meeting is with Foreign Minister Hoshar Zabari of Iraq this evening uh, at 5.30 to 7 o'clock. I hope you'll be here for that too. So, President Marzuki, before he was President Marzuki, was known as one of the great fighters for human rights in North Africa and the Arab world, and in the world, I would say. Uh, he was forced to live in exile for many years under the Ben Ali dictatorship. Uh, he often fought uh, for the freedom to speak of the, what were then the most hated and vilified groups in Tunisia, the, uh, those associated with Ennahda and uh, Rashid Ghanoushi, who was also in exile. Uh, and now that those people are hugely influential in running Tunisia, Mr. Marzouki, President Marzouki, has the office that he has today. And there is a sense of, I think, familiarity and almost camaraderie between you and those groups, although you are not anyone who could be classified as an Islamist, as I understand it. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is a little bit about the Arab Spring, which was launched in Tunisia and where things are going now, that the Arab Spring looks like, well, looks like hell in a lot of countries. Um, I had the feeling that uh, sometimes when I look at, at what happened in Tunisia, it's a little bit like, if any of you, I think most of you remember, Slovenia in the Balkans. They broke away from Yugoslavia, came away more or less safe and sound, and everything else fell apart and went to hell. Is Tunisia going to remain safe and sound given all the turmoil that exists now? Of course, uh, I, this is what I hope, but uh, you know, Tunisia is not an island, and when you have uh, on your border, you have a country like Libya where uh, you know, uh, the level of violence is extremely high, and when you have what the situation you got in Egypt, and when we have also the situation in Syria, Syria is becoming uh, an eternal problem because we have a lot of young people uh, going to Syria, more than 500 jihadist Tunisian, 500 jihad Tunisian jihadists are in Syria and we are very afraid that when they come back to Tunisia, you know, it will be the same thing that happened with Algeria. You, you probably know that in the 80s, a lot of Algerians went to Afghanistan and then they come back to Algeria and this was the, the beginning of, the he of hell in, in Algeria too. So. Uh, we are doing our best in Tunisia, you know, to, to, to control the situation. We, we, think, we, think that we, have, we think that we have a wise population. We think we have to have, uh, you know, uh, 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 of course, we, ha we, we do have a disciplined and professional army. Uh, we think that we are a middle class society, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you, you, nobody can be sure uh, of what could happen. We, uh, last year I, uh, I was here and I remember that I was, I was asked many, many questions about the outcome of the uh, Arab Spring. I was very optimistic at that time. I wouldn't say that I am now pessimistic. I would say like yes, I said yesterday that I am pissy optimistic because, <laughs> because uh, it turns out <coughs> to be the, the situation is much more complex and much more uh, difficult than, uh, than, I, uh, than I thought. Yes, we can. We will probably we we can uh, achieve the, the the transition in Tunisia. But once again, we are not alone. And we'll, when we see what's happening in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria, uh, we can be uh, a little bit upset. But once again, uh, I have to say, I have to repeat that you cannot say, well, the, it's a failure or it's a success. We need time. You know, you cannot say that the revolution is a success or a failure before, let's say, a decade. When you think that the French Revolution, for, for instance, they, they, they had to wait more than 70 years before having the Third Republic, which was probably the, the success of the French Revolution. So you cannot expect Arabs or, uh, or any, any country you know, to, to achieve the goals of revolution in, in just two or three years. So 
we have to be uh, we, we have to be very careful. I'm very careful, but I I think that the outcome would be quite different from uh, a country to another. And that Tunisia, I wouldn't say you could you can bet on Tunisia, but my, I, I'm I'm still confident that we we could we could succeed. But of course, nobody knows. Wow. <laughs> Well, I think that's an honest interpretation of events. Mm -hmm. the, when we talk about threats to Tunisia, we can also talk about Tunisia's advantages. You say that it's, it's a middle class society, it has a long history uh, under Habib Bourguiba, certainly, of, trying, of becoming a, what we would call a more westernized society. Mm -hmm. uh, women's rights have been enshrined for a very long time. Yeah. One of the questions that comes up as we look at Tunisia, to now, uh, Tunisia now, even if we put aside all those threats that you've described, is whether that spirit in Tunisia, that in many ways made it very strong and resilient, can continue under the present government and as the new uh, constitution takes shape, which is very slow taking shape. Mm -mm. I mean, will, for instance, the rights of women in Tunisia be as solidly enshrined now as they were in the 1950s? Of course, but uh, le let me just give you a brief, sit a brief uh, description of what's happening in Tunisia. Now we are facing three challenges, major three challenges. So otherwise you, you cannot ex uh, understand this, the whole situation. The first challenge that we are, uh, is the terrorist challenge. We didn't expect Tunisia to be, uh, to have this problem. I, I think last year, uh, the government, myself and the government, we underestimated this, this threat because we didn't expect, except that the situation would worsen in Mali, in, in Libya, and so forth. So now we have to deal with this problem, uh, unexpected problem. The second problem is uh, uh, reaching a consensus, which was our choice, turned out to be extremely difficult. We didn't, accept, we didn't think that it would be that hard. But we, have, we, we, uh, we still stick to this choice because you, you saw what happened in Egypt. What happened in Egypt is because they didn't have this national dialogue going on for months and four years like we have in Tunisia. So even if it's difficult, even if it takes time, we are going to stick to this choice. And the third challenge is the economic problem because we have had this revolution because of you know, the, the high level of poverty, the high level of uh, people without jobs, young people without jobs, and so forth. So now, because of the uncertainty of the, of the, uh, of the situation, because of the, you know, this transition too long, uh, investors, whether coming from outside or from, in, uh, from Tunisia, you know, they're very hesitating in uh, investing in the, in, the, in the economy. So uh, the s economic situation is worsening, you know. And if we have this situation worsening, that means that we will have more and more unrest and that this could, you know, p uh, jeopardize the, the, the whole political process. So th this is, th those are the main challenges we are facing. And we have to deal with the three, the three challenges at the same time. Fortunately, as I, as I told you, we, we, we have a strong civil society, we have a middle class uh, society, we have wise people, we, uh, we have this solid and professional uh, military. So we, we are not uh, uh, helpless, you know, to, to, uh, to face these uh, this major threats. About your question, uh, the question was about women's and the constitution. Well, I would like to give the floor to women, you know, uh, involved in writing the constitution. I think she would be uh, better than me to, to, to answer your question. Well, okay, maybe we can do that in the question and answer period. We'll come back to you on that. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, when you talk about terrorism uh, being much worse than you expected, yeah. are you thinking also that that is related to the couple of very high profile political murders uh, in Tunisia that, that set things very much on edge over the last year, particularly the one last summer. Is, is that a result of terrorism? Who, who carried out those murders? It isn't clear to me when you've got people who are working on the Constitution who are suddenly murdered. Mm. That's, a, that's a fairly um, unconventional political system. Every time we, uh, we, it seems that we are very close, you know, to, to have this, to reach this famous uh, political consensus that then we have had this assassination. The first one, uh, Shokri Belaid was assassinated in February, and the second, uh, Brahmi was assassinated uh, in July. 
25th of July. And I can assure you that 24th of July, I was quite sure that we were going to have this, uh, this uh, unity government, that we are going to finish the constitution in two months' time, and so forth. And then we have had this assassination, so we, we are quite sure that there is something, somebody, you know, some, some people thinking that this uh, uh, democracy should fail in Tunisia. And the only way to, to, to make it fail is to have this political assassination because they do know that they cannot, they cannot have a coup like uh, in other countries, you know, because the specificity of our, our military, they can't have the population. So the only way to stop the process is by uh, murdering uh, political activists. And this is what happened because uh, the, the whole political process is, uh, is stopped since, since that, uh, that assassi assassination. And now we are having a lot of, it's extremely difficult, you know, to resume the, the, the work of the uh, uh, Constituent Assembly, and we are talking about the new government and so forth. So they, uh, it's, uh, they know what they do, those people. Who are they? Probably uh, Ansari Sharia, it's, uh, it's a group of Salafists and this group of Salafists is extremely linked to the, the whole, um, uh, it's, it's kind of network, you know. This Ansari Sharia, you have these this people in Libya, you have them in, in, uh, in Syria, mainly in Syria, in Iraq. And I guess it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, part of Al-Qaeda. Uh, and this network, you know, is completely decided to abort the, the, the whole process, the democratic process in the Arab world. Because don't, don't forget that uh, I think the, when we have this uh, Arab Spring, uh, Al Qaeda was no longer, you know, uh, heard. Uh, it's it, so, sometimes I, I used to, th to think that it would be over with Al Qaeda because uh, Al Qaeda, you know, uh, was the, the the might of Al Qaeda was to say, hey, we are the only uh, way to get, uh, you know, to to overcome dictatorship, corrupted dictatorship in, the, in, in Arab countries. And then you have this uh, Arab Spring, which is led by Democrats, by civil society, by young people, without no, uh, uh, no religious background. And this was a terrible thing for, for, for Al-Qaeda. And now, I think Al-Qaeda and this network of terrorists, they, they, they believe that it's, it's now their time you know, to, to, to go and to stop the political process. So, you, you will have a renewal of, uh, of the Islamist, uh, the, the extremist Islamist movement. And what I'm afraid of, what's happening now in Egypt, I must be very, very, very uh, of course I have to be diplomats, but I also have to, to, to say the truth. You know, what's happening now in Egypt is extremely dangerous because this, uh, uh, this Muslim Brotherhood, I'm not, I don't agree with the way that they uh, behave. I don't agree with the way that the, the, the government Egypt. I don't agree with the, the way that, you know, they didn't have this uh, national dialogue we have had in Tunisia and so forth. But the fact that, no, this central part of the Islamist spectrum, and it's the central part of this spectrum, and it's also a moderate part of the spectrum, being put aside, this will give all the opportunity, you know, for the extremists now to have the, 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 the to, to play a very, very dangerous role because they will not they will not have this very dangerous rival. I mean, this central spot. So the vacuum will be filled by the extremists, and this is the most dangerous thing for us and probably for you, for the West. It's 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 sad, but this is the situation. Well, I mean, you know, a lot of right now we hear from. We won't go on about Egypt, but just to put it in context, right now we hear from the Egyptian uh, government, the military-backed government there, that basically the uh, Muslim Brotherhood are terrorists, that the people affiliated with them are terrorists, that they open the doors to terrorists in Egypt. You know, people do say the same thing about the Anahda-dominated government in Tunisia. There are plenty of enemies of your government who say it it essentially open the door to this kind of terrorism that is existing there, that it endorses it. And that, on the other side of things, it got uh, maybe 37, 38 percent of the vote in 2011, but runs the country as if it is the only party in the country compared to w other forces. Now that may well be unfair. It's completely unfair. But I thought I would give you a chance it's to respond to it. It's completely unfair, but f because First of all, when, when I hear that Tunisia is governed by uh, an Islamist uh, uh, government, that's not true because, once again, uh, 
Tunisia is led by a coalition. And within this coalition, you have um, the President of the Republic, myself, I am secular. The President of the uh, Constituent Assembly is also secular. Both of us, we have been a human rights activists for more than 20 years. Uh, with the, the government itself, you have, uh, you have ministers from, uh, from our two political parties and also from uh, independent, independent uh, people. So, uh, so saying that uh, Tunisia is governed by uh, another is not true. It's completely unfair. It's not true. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, this coalition is uh, still working. We have had a lot of problems. We have had a lot of discussion. We, will, we, we disagree on many, many subjects. We have, we have to discuss hours and hours, you know, to reach a consensus within the coalition itself. So, and look, what, what, what happened uh, until now, uh, I, I don't think that the Sharia law has been imposed in Tunisia. Uh, I never heard that uh, the, the, the government, you know, uh, imposed the, 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 the Sharia or anything else. So it's, it, it's a nonsense to, to say that uh, Another uh, is ruling Tunisia. Another is part of this coalition. And you probably know that Another has accepted that the, the next prime minister would be an independent, so we could ha we would go to elections, and everybody is quite sure that this election would be fair and, uh, and transparent and so forth. The second point about the relationship between Another and terrorism, it's, uh, I know Another people for, for more than 20 years because when I, was, uh, when I was the chair of the Human Rights League and they were in prison, uh, I, uh, we accepted in the Human Rights League to defend them because we are quite sure that we are peaceful people and they never, never uh, use force. The, it was the first condition, you know, to, uh, to accept, uh, to, to, to protect and to, to defend the, the rights. But I, I must confess that uh, the beginning after the revolution, we, we and underestimated the, the level of danger of, of terrorists. And myself, uh, I, I, I was part of this, uh, this mistake. But how, how could you, how could you uh, imagine that we, we, are, we are going to have political assassination, that we could have uh, uh, people coming from Mali? Who, who could uh, uh, foresaw that something would happen in Mali, you know? So, but now we, uh, we, uh, we probably know that uh, Mr. Ali Lari, who is the Prime Minister, uh, you know, had a press conference two, uh, two, or two weeks ago and said that Ansari Sharia is a terrorist group. He said it very clearly. And now we have uh, the, the security forces, the, the army. We, we, we are uh, all the time uh, behind this, the, those guys. And the, the, the Islamists are also part of this uh, repression of the, 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 uh, of the, the, the jihadists. And I can assure you that for, for the extremists, the most uh, hated enemy is not, uh, not the secular, but the Islamists the, of Nahda. Okay. I think now we'll open the, uh, the floor to questions. I think if, we, if I could ask you a question, just quickly, if we could give you a microphone. I know you've been working on the, uh, the um, Constitution, and and please don't give us a discourse on constitutional law here. No, no. <laughs> uh, but I would just love to know whether you think at the end of the day the rights of women in Tunisia as they have been understood since Habib Bourguiba in the 1950s will be guaranteed by the new constitution. Look, I think I have a... Um, an important vantage point here because I'm a member of the Constituent Assembly, also a member of the committee that draft the preamble, the fundamental principle and the rules to amend the Constitution. And I've spent most of um, pretty much a year and a half debating with my colleagues. And I can tell you from the very, very beginning, uh, we wanted to enshrine the legacy of uh, fights for the rights of women right right on the in the preamble because we said right at the beginning that women and men citizens are equal in rights and duties and i think we've always said the preamble is the spirit of the constitution this the preamble is here to guide the constitution to lead the way and uh, when we start discussing um, it was really important to start with that very strong statement 
Um, now, I'm just, you know, sometimes I'm wondering how can we top that if in our preamble we say men and women are equal, and it's a very clear sentence. I think you can't really make an, a mistake on interpretation. Now, there have been a discussion um, in the committees at the same time than the preamble committees, and that is the reason why there might have not been a good coordination, and some of the committees wrote articles when they were saying that women are the complementary of men, etc. But what happened when we coordinated, then they saw that the preamble, uh, our group, you know, enshrined the rights of women right away. So they, they, they streamlined everything, and now it's pretty much, you know, uh, guaranteed. I mean, again, you know, you, writing a constitution is not, you know, is not what will guarantee this. It's a strong statement, and then it's, we, we need a strong civil society, we need strong organization, and I think uh, in Tunisia we are very lucky to have that. Thank you.